Welcome to the concurrent second sessions of the concurrent sessions for day two of Siapumelela Conference. My name is Elizabeth Boy. I'm going to be the chair of the session. Um, all I expect um, our participants in this session, if you have any question for our presenters, please uh, put it in the chat. Um, and then after the presentation is done, please make sure that you, um, you raise your hand if you want to ask a question. <clears throat> Our presenter, Ninette, you've got 20 minutes to do your presentation and I'm going to give 10 minutes to allow for question and answer so that people can engage with your presentation. So just pace yourself and welcome to this session. We're going to hear from Ninette Krauss um, her topic is analyzing the influence and impact of student support structures on first year law students. Over to you, Ninette. Thank you, Elizabeth and colleagues for the opportunity to share some of my experiences um, specifically on student support structures on our first year law students. I do not know what I'm doing. I don't even know where to begin. Why did I think studying law was a good idea? These would be some of the things that can be overheard when a group of first year law students are discussing their adjustment to university and how they had no subjects at school that really prepared them for studying law. We as a law faculty at the Northwest University wants to ensure that these discussions do not end up just being question marks and uncertainties that the students have to walk around with. No, we want to ensure that our students know that they belong at the university, at the law faculty, that um, we care for them, that they're not alone, and that there is support and assistance available. So the presentation is a reflection specifically on a three-year program within the law faculty. This was obviously not done in a silo, but together with our Center of Teaching and Learning. And today's um, presentation is to reflect on this three-year program when we specifically appointed tutors and academic peer mentors to, to assist our first-year students and to ensure that those conversations as mentioned in the beginning do not stop there. Prior to this program, our faculty did not use tutorials or tutors at all within the faculty and we did not use the academic peer mentors to the extent that we use them in this specific program. So there are two basic reasons or two important factors that played a role in our decision to commence with this program and specifically to institute tutorials and academic peer mentors. The one was the 2015, 2016, when the CHE undertook a national review of the LLB program and a report was published in 2018. And certain parts of that report does spend time and focus on student support and the support that is available for law students within the different faculties and different support that's available, whether it's only faculty-based, institutional-based, or maybe a combination of both. And then adding to that is the general reality of the throughput rate for LLB students nationwide. And just to put this in perspective, about a third of law students actually graduate within four years or complete the LLB within four years. Four years is the minimum time period to complete your LLB. Slightly more than 50% pass within six years. So that's the maximum time period. But the alarming number is the 45%, which according to the information does not graduate at all. So Taking the CHE report into consideration, taking the stark and dark reality of um, throughput rate into consideration, the law faculty submitted a proposal to the DHET to obtain certain UCDP grant proposal. Fortunately for us, this was also in line, all of the projects were in line with our teaching and learning strategy at the Northwest University. So the purpose of the project or the focus was to have activities linked to student support and development. And all of this should be underpinned by our graduate attributes, ensuring responsible citizenship and achieving success in the workplace. 
So our aim was inter alia to provide the necessary support to our law students to help them so that they can transition from self-study to self-direction, from high school to higher education, and to promote social and collaborative learning within the faculty. And further, a reflection on the growth that appointed tutors and mentors will receive when being part of this program. So the research question is, what is the impact and the influence of student support structures on first year law students? And a mixed methodology approach was used. Questionnaires, reviews, interviews, marks, data analysis to answer this research question. And while we focus on three years from 2018 until 2020, and the reason for that is those were the three years that we received the grant, so the UCDP funds. Thereafter, we um, fell within the university system from center for, for CTL within the student support directorate, tutorial, supplement instructions, and um, mentoring. So when we started with this project, there were some things that we had to consider. How are we going to find suitable candidates? Where are we going to find them? And what do we actually see as suitable candidates? Uh, what's the training for our mentors, our tutors, our lecturers? How are we going to introduce these services to our students? And then maybe one that I should have started with, how are we going to structure this or implement this within our LLB, BCom and BA program? And also bearing in mind over three campuses across two provinces. Fortunately for us, we didn't have to rely only on our own knowledge, but we can we could gain sufficient information and knowledge from scientific research that was already done from colleagues in CTL that were willing to help us and, and, um, and support us and actually share in our vision that we wanted to achieve. And I think this also links with what was said yesterday, as well as this morning in some sessions where we cannot work in a silo. We cannot work as a faculty only on our own or uh, as center of teaching and learning on our own. We have to work collaboratively towards the goal of providing the necessary support. Because what was important for our faculty is that we had a, um, a more focused and involved approach with regards to our student support, and that the support that is available to our students is also what they need. Because sometimes we provide support, but that is not what is needed by the students. So in looking at these four questions, I'm not going to go into detail with each of them, because I really want to get to the feedback that we received from the st students during the three years, and then also where we can see we can learn. But just for some background information, um, we decided on tutorials and mentoring specifically to help our uh, first year students, and it was aimed at our first year students. We had um, two modules, which is very subject and content orientated, um, where the students will deal with legal concepts, case law, legislation, and all of those things for the first time in their lives, where we decided that tutors would be, would be a valuable instrument where they can have another opportunity to engage with the content and different ways of using it and how do you approach it and how do you apply it. And then our other two main modules for our first years are more skills modules and foundation modules, namely an introduction to law and legal skills module and the language skills in the legal context module. And that is where we initially allocated our academic year module. So for our tutorials, the students were divided into groups of about 30 students and each tutor had three to four groups. That means each tutor presented a tutorial for about three or four times a week. Um, with our mentoring, what we decided to do is we wanted our first year students to at least have one meeting with an academic peer mentor to see where they are. Are they adjusting to university? Are they connecting? Are they making friends? Do they know how to approach their law modules? What is the progress they are making? I mean, time management skills, goal setting, all of those things included. And the way for us that, that worked initially was to schedule specific times during the week that the academic peer mentors would be available for the students to come and see them. And we collaborated with the lecturers in the sense of 
Student Satisfaction Match work at the mentor. So that means it has an opportunity for the student to actually engage with the mentor, even if it was just to ask, hi, how are you? What are you currently doing? What assignments are you? Things like that. And then maybe also to collect it from them where marks can be discussed and um, common mistakes that we make can be pointed out and things that the student can do to really improve. So that is initially how, our, how we structured our tutorials and our mentoring. Um, first year students based on a content module or more a foundation and a skill module. To get to the important part or, or the part that I enjoy is the feedback from our students. So just to give you some idea for tutorials, once again, this was the first time the students were confronted with attending tutorials, obviously also first year at university. The senior students were aware of supplement instruction, so they didn't always understand the difference between the two. Um, but luckily with proper training and information, they were able to do that. So initially you'll see I split this between 2018, 2019 on the left-hand side and then 2020 and 2021 on the right-hand side. Um, so our figures were not, I want to say, um, astounding to begin with. We had a 57% in the one module, a 66% in the other one, and then a bit of a drop in 2019. And I think that drop can be attributed to what is the consequences if I do not attend, is it really compulsory? Um, and, and those kind of things really played a role and an impact in, in our attendance figures. And then for 2020, um, we split it a bit so that students, we said those ones that attended at least once or we needed, then the ones that attended regularly, but maybe not all of the sessions and then the ones that always attend. So from that, there was definitely an improvement in the number of students that attended, but also for that, it was more online attendance where in 2018 and 2019, it was physical attendance. A student had to be in class when the tutorial were presented. But in 2020 and 2021, they could access the information at the later stage, but still be deemed to have attended a session. So what is the feedback from the students? We asked them three questions. Was the sessions helpful? Were the sessions productive? Um, obviously, we don't want students to attend something and, it's, and it's, they feel they didn't gain anything from it. Then was there sufficient link between what's happening in your class, between what's happening in the tutorial, which is in essence a central and integral part of successful tutorials? And then did the tutorial actually address your difficulties in the specific module? And I think from this, we got an overwhelming positive response from the students who attended. Um, and I think specifically we must comment the link that there was between tutorials and the formal class and how that grew in three years from a 72% to students at 86% of them felt that there was a sufficient link between that. And that um, shows also how the lecturers in a specific module grew in confidence on how to use the tutors but also the benefit of certain tutors um, being involved in more than one year of the tutorial program. And then um, for me, what's very important is that the tutorial actually addresses the difficulties that the students experienced in the module. Not what we as a lecturer might think they think is difficult, but what they are really struggling with and that that is being addressed at a tutorial level as well. So that is very encouraging signs. Unfortunately, you have to look, or fortunately, I don't know. Um, we don't want to emphasize or only look at academic performance to determine the success of a program or not. But I think for tutorials and, and academic peer mentoring, you have to look at academic performance. And what we did here on the left-hand side is a, an average for students who attended tutorials versus students who didn't attend. So they didn't attend any session, didn't download anything with regards to the tutorials. Um, they went to class, but they just didn't attend the tutorial. And although the marks, the average mark maybe doesn't differ a lot, except for 2019. Um, for me, it's, it's very good that students who attended tutorials always pass the module. Whereas in 2019 and 2020, they didn't even pass the students who failed to attend. So that I think is encouraging signs and definitely ways that we can use to improve our attendance 
and for students to see the value in tutorials as well. Then obviously from the student's own perspective, they were asked, did you think your academic performance improved after attending tutorials? And 20, 2018, 71% said yes, 2019, that was 79%. And then in 2020, only 65% of them believe that they actually improved. But that is still very good percentages where, where the majority of students who made use of it and completed the questionnaire were of the opinion that the academic performance improved. From the academic peer mentor side, we asked the students, um, and I will tell you now why I've included 2021 here as well. But specifically, if you look at 2018, 19, and 20, they were asked three questions. Were you in contact with an academic peer mentor? Could the academic peer mentor help you? And do you want them to be available for the duration of your study? So not only in your first year, but in your second year and third year and final year as well. So we started off with about 55% of our first year students being in contact with an academic peer mentor. And that increased to 65%. And then there was a bit of a drop to 60% in 2020, which overall I do not think is, is a bad reflection, but that also is a student that approached a mentor once and never again. So um, if we do a bit more in-depth analysis of this, um, it might be a, a bit of a different picture on those ones that walked a path with the students for the duration of the year and those ones that approach them were needed. But I mean, that is also good. And then could the academic peer mentor help you? Overall, that is very good percentages that they said there. But for me, the most encouraging about this is do you want the academic peer mentor available for the duration of your studies? And I mean, the lowest percentage is 81% of them that actually said yes. So that also shows you the value that they themselves see in an academic peer mentor and that they want the academic peer mentor to be available um, for them. The reason for the drop in percentages, specifically in 2021, is the academic, academic peer mentors, apologies, are not only available for our first year students, but to the whole faculty. So 34% of all of our law students actually had contact with an academic peer mentor in 2021. And the reason also for the drop and could they help you to 51% is the queries became a lot more, um, a lot wider and not module specific or first year specific like in 2018. Um, a lot of it was questions with regards to counseling, wellness, um, for example, our meal a day project, um, counseling, finances, all of those things where students had to be referred, which played a role in their response. And then also where students would say like, help me with an assignment, or is this correct in my assignment, which the academic peer mentors are not allowed to do. They're allowed to work collaboratively with the student, but obviously not provide them with the answers. Um, once again, something that's always important to me is, Will the students recommend this to their friends? And overwhelmingly, the students said yes. We would tell our friends to also attend tutorials and we would tell our friends to make use of academic peer mentors. And I mean, if this doesn't show that the students actually value and appreciate the support that's available, um, I'm not sure what will. And then just some very shortly, because I think I'm almost out of time, is what was the benefits for our tutors and mentors? So initially, we, we had some skills that we wanted our mentors and tutors to, to show before we wanted to appoint them. And these were the skills that they themselves said that they were improving by being a tutor and by being a mentor. And these skills also will help them when they are in the legal profession, when they start working, and also by being part of this team, it's, a, it's so much value that they receive from it from their own perspective and from what they're saying when we receive their feedback as well, and how these skills will just benefit them in the workplace. So from them, um, these were some of the things that they um, stated that the, the privileges, the benefits, the advantages that they got from this is that their confidence was boosted, they gained more experience. Um, I think the second one really stands out to me is um, the gratification that the mentors received from, from being there, from um, when they bring their friends, other students bring their friends to come and see me because they see it help. Um, and like they said, and this is basically what a mentor should be, it should be a friend and somebody that believes in students 
and it also holds them accountable. Um, so it's, it's very good for us to see that and also that they realize how different people are and to think out of the box. And I mean, if you can start thinking out of the box, it's just going to help you in your career. It doesn't matter where you go. So for our students, um, to summarize some of the things that they said they benefit from or what they really enjoyed was the communication, the wider perspective, um, to engage with other students. Um, and it was for some of them, it was a revision where for others, it was it, it teaches them not to be afraid to ask questions. And I mean, they even said it was fun and it was relatable. So I think if we had a specific list, which we had in the beginning of things that we wanted to achieve, um, we would be able to tick off a lot just by some of the responses that we received from the students. Um, other things that they said is it helped me to gain confidence. I'm, for example, able to answer questions in class now, which I wasn't able to before. It even helped me to lessen my stress levels, um, group discussions. Um, once again, that collaborative is important to them. And then um, just for example, during the COVID pandemic, where a lot of our students started working, um, they were also still able to access the tutorial. If it was done on WhatsApp, or whether it was done via a recording that was made available. So they could still access it even though they were working during the day. Um, okay, so some of the shortcomings, I'm going to be very quick, um, that, that we've um, discussed about or things that we want to improve on is, and a lot of them kind of links together is, should this be compulsory? If it's compulsory, how do we enforce it? Um, should we schedule it on our timetables? Currently, tutorials is not on our timetable. Should we make a, should we try and make a plan to fit it in so that the students know on this day during this time slot I will have a tutorial? Or is it because it's flexible actually helping the students? And if it's compulsory, how do we encourage the students to attend? If it's not compulsory, how do we engage with them? Um, students use various methods of engaging with the students. We had prizes, Kahoot games. Um, and I think the different ways that they are engaging with the content is actually helping the students because it caters for different learning styles, whether you're a visual learner or you want to hear or whatever that might be. And then something that I think is important is the turnover of your appoint appointed mentors and tutors. You do not want to begin every year with 20 new tutors and mentors. You want to have them sort of grow with you and the program. So you want senior tutors and mentors that can mentor the junior ones that have been appointed. So initially, for example, we appointed a lot of postgraduate mentors um, and that meant in the second year, it was difficult because a lot of them finished with their studies. Um, so what we learned is to start with students, maybe in their second year, be a tutor, in their third year, they can be a mentor, in their fourth year, they can be a mentor. Um, and then the nice thing where it becomes full circle is where we have students that um, were in the tutorial class or were a mentee, and they are now becoming tutors and mentors. So the program really has become full circle in, in that extent. And just where we started in 2018 as part of a UCDP project, and where we are currently as part of the university, um, part of CTLs and um, different programs, we started with 18 tutors in two modules, only the module subject or content heavy modules. Where we are now with 29 tutors in six modules, um, also the extended program students and also two, um, two second year modules. And our academic peer mentors have grown to 14. We've allocated them not only to first year students, but also to at risk students, basically to any student who wants assistance. And they are presenting workshops and webinars on certain skills that, that the students want to um, improve on. And for example, case law. Um, and things like that, that's very important for us as law students, we can have these extra webinars and workshops where the students can really engage um, and can get assistance. So to conclude, um, the tutors and the mentors have helped to develop the soft skills that is needed for our students to be self-directed and to adapt to higher education. They play an important role for, to assist our students in managing their expectations, setting goals and to engage with the content. And once again, it helps to form collaborative learning and support groups. The appointed tutors and mentors, they grow in confidence and leadership abilities. And at the end of the day, my opinion is that this program 
has had a far reaching impact and influence, and it has definitely assisted us in our goal and our duty to ensure that the law students receive the best possible education with the necessary support to equip them to deal with the challenges ahead. I mean, obviously more work lies ahead, but I think with the solid foundation, with the backing of our institution and with the shared vision, um, it can only continue to grow. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ninette. Um, are there any questions for Ninette? And thank you again for a wonderful presentation on the influence uh, and impact of student support structures on your first year law student at Northwest University. Are there any questions for Ninette or comments? Uh, we've got five minutes. Anyone? I see there's one um, question in the chat about how does your academic peer mentor differ from an academic tutor? Um, yeah. I don't think I've addressed that maybe sufficiently in, in my presentation. Yeah. Um, Go ahead. Thank you. In essence, the, the tutorial is for subject content. So they will focus on a, on a, on a specific modules and content wise. Um, it is uh, the lecturer provides them with specific information that they need um, with worksheets that the students can complete and then the students do that in a collaborative small group setting. Um, so the idea is that there should be a proper and a formal link between your formal lecture and your tutorial. Uh, for example, if you're discussing a case, you can let the students read it in your tutorial, do a summary and then continue with the class or complete the worksheet and then further discuss it in your class. When academic peer mentor is, I want to say almost somebody that acts as a friend. It's literally somebody that helps you to adjust to university life in general, to help you to make that transition. So you can ask them anything with regards to bursary applications. Um, how do I approach different modules? How do I do my time management? How do I set goals? Um, basically all of, all of those kind of things. I hope that answered your question. Uh, there is another question in the chat. Are your academic peer mentors volunteers or are they paid? I think thankfully, and that is one of the incentives that we can use to, to get students is that they are paid. Um, initially, when we started the project, we were very fortunate and they could be paid a monthly salary. But now, like all, I think most universities and um, student um, uh, employees or student appointees, they can work a maximum of 23 hours a month and they claim according to that, whether they're an undergraduate student or a postgraduate student. Um, so I think that helps um, with regards to get students to actually apply. One of the other benefits is we do acknowledge and give them credit at our prestige function at the faculty. So they get certificates as well for their work and recognition. It's something that they can add onto their CVs um, as well. I mean, that is now the nice benefits that you can actually tell them, save for the, the personal growth that they do experience by being part of the program. Thank you. Okay. Um, there is one comment, very good initiative and presentation in it was done. It's just a comment and Rafael is giving you a clap <laughs> and I'm giving you the loudest one. Um, my question in this two minutes, I can abuse it since I'm the chair and there are no questions. Are the students, um, can they opt out of attending the, the sessions with the mentors? Or is it something compulsory that they have to do it? At this stage, they can opt out. So it's not compulsory. Um, I would like it to be compulsory for all first year students. Um, so my initiative or my idea is during the first semester, all of the first year students should have at least a monthly meeting with an academic peer mentor. And then based on the academic performance that can be lessened or increased during the second semester. And for the senior students, it's something that they can use when and if needed. And then also, since we are using it for our identified at risk students, for them it is compulsory, they can't opt out. Okay. Uh, on behalf of everyone who is here, thank you very much for a very 
insightful presentation and the work that you guys are doing at Northwest University. I am now going to, in this uh, minute, we are five o'clock on my time. Uh, we have a presentation uh, by Rafael Alvarez. I hope I'm saying your say name correctly. And the presentation is on learning culture as a strategy for student success, moving from theory to practice. Uh, Rafael, like with other presenters, at least give your presentation 20 minutes and allow for 10 minutes for question and answer so that people can give you comments or can ask you questions relating to what you just shared with them. Over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bowie. Let's begin. Hello, friends. I am honored to contribute this presentation on learning culture as a strategy for student success. In fact, I have brought a learning culture revolution to the Sia Fumalela conference for the purpose of sharing educational wealth to help transform student lives. And I am doing my part to make San Diego City College the learning culture college. Before introducing myself, here is a brief look at the US higher education system. Our institutions of higher education include universities, which have a focus on instruction and research and offer bachelor's and advanced level degrees, and community colleges, which provide lower division academic preparation and skills training to prepare students for employment or transfer to upper division studies in universities. Community colleges offer certificates of completion and associate degrees. Our largest ethnic groups include white, Hispanic, black, and Asian students, with Hispanic referring to students from Spanish speaking backgrounds, typically originating from Latin America. And by definition, Hispanic serving institutions have an enrollment with 25% or more Hispanic students. For example, San Diego City College, a community college in the state of California is an Hispanic serving institution with 46% Hispanic students. It is also important to note that the majority of Hispanic and black students in higher education attend a community college. I am Rafael Alvarez, the director of the San Diego City College Mathematics, Engineering, Science Achievement Program, the MESA program. I am also the corner man for my MESA creators and the, and the leader of the learning culture revolution. To understand why the learning culture revolution matters, it is necessary to begin by looking at the six-year completion rates for students who began their college studies in 2014 from the National Student Clearinghouse Research Center. On the left are rates for entering university students and the rates for entering community college students are on the right. On average, entering community college students, Asian, white, Hispanic, and black, completed their studies at a rate 37% lower than the completion rate for entering university students. Also on average, entering Hispanic and black students in both community college and universities completed their studies at a rate 32% lower than the completion rate for entering Asian and white students. However, we know that these rates do not reflect the great potential that all students have, but how can student success be increased? Through intentional, culturally responsive pedagogy, asset-based approaches focused on strengths, and experiential learning, yes, through guided pathways, competency-based learning, and high-impact educational practices, yes, these and other efforts are certainly important, and they must continue. However, I propose starting by turning on the lights, and then do what is needed to increase student success. Imagine the difference if all students learn how to learn when they begin their college studies. The learning culture is a crucial foundation for the success of every student. I say do everything needed to increase student success, but make sure that the lights are on. Otherwise, the students are in the dark with regards to the learning culture, and those efforts and initiatives are not going to be as effective as they can and must be. I founded the City College Mesa program in 2000. But this revolution began in 2009, when I found this research in which successful first-generation college students were interviewed to understand what it takes for college readiness and success. The researchers identified 10 factors, which they grouped into three categories. However, factor number 10 was my light bulb moment. 
Very simply, to be successful, students must understand the college system, college standards, and the culture of college. I too was a first generation Hispanic engineering student at Harvey Mudd College. And, and as the oldest in my family, I didn't know anyone who went to college from my East San Diego neighborhood. What did I know about the learning culture? Nothing, but I knew instantly that the students in the study were right. There is a culture for learning in every institution of higher education. However, students are not made aware of it when they begin their college studies. I then made it my mission to explicitly train my students in the learning culture to help transform their lives. We are all familiar with culture as an ethnic culture, a group culture, or a family culture. And we enjoy being part of many cultures. It is in our DNA. It matters, and it is everywhere. One of my favorite cultures is the lowrider car culture. But to understand the learning culture, it is first necessary to recognize that every culture has two main parts, as illustrated by this culture iceberg. The surface part is easily seen and can be experienced in many ways, but the things in the deep part cannot be seen, yet they exist and they are often very important. Here are the two parts of the learning culture that exist in every institution of higher education. Certainly, it is important to know how to approach the learning. This includes practices and strategies that are performed before, during, and after a class. However, the more important and larger part is having a mindset for learning. Give me a student who has a strong mindset for learning, and I will show you a successful student because they will commit to mastering the approach to the learning. It is also important to recognize that the learning culture is primarily deep culture which means that it is not easily seen or learned by students. The result is that students are generally in the dark about the learning culture. Here is the challenge for all college students. Student potential is not questioned in the learning culture. All students have many strengths and great potential, but they also have gaps. When students have a low GPA, fail classes, or drop out of college, a key reason for this is that they have gaps and they have not been introduced to the learning culture. The challenge for students is to learn the learning culture and use it to fill their gaps to create to create their own success and achieve their goals. I'm waiting. I'm pausing here for a moment for the video. OK, this this is Mesa legend, Mr. Ferrari, as shown in this video, his story illustrates the power of the learning culture. Hello, my name is Francis Rowe and I got an A in Calculus 1. My major is Mechanical Engineering. I started the Mesa program with only three weeks left in my spring semester. The whole time I was trucking, I was trying as hard as I possibly could. And without the Mesa program, I would have never gotten an A. You know, I was working, I studied, I tried everything, and I thought I was you know, making headway. I got my first test back, I got a B. And I was just so depressed. I felt like, man, I don't even, why am I even doing this? I'm trying as hard as I can and I can never get an A. And after the first time I, I was introduced to this, after my first test, I got an A back and it felt like things were working. It felt like you got, I got my first, like, like it, it felt like what it must have felt like when they start, when they learned what fire it was. Could you imagine what that's like? This Mesa program is. I can't even explain it. I'm going to pass this on to my kids, to my kids' kids, and I want this to be a culture because it, it's kind of like someone handing you a Ferrari. It's basically the same thing. You, you learn it, you become an engineer, and you buy a Ferrari. It's, you, I, I'm lost for words how amazing this program is. Yes, Mr. Ferrari experienced a powerful transformation from depression and doubt to discovering fire when he was introduced to the learning culture. This happened at the end of a semester, and he then used the learning culture to take control of his academics and life. Before being re relocated out of San Diego, Mr. Ferrari returned one last time to tell me, thank you for changing my life. His experience reminds us that in the light of the learning culture, we find hope, and in the dark, we find trauma that is depression, self-doubt, and abandoned dreams. Many of our students are being traumatized. This is what's at stake, the opportunity to transform student lives. Get this out of here. 
These five parts capture the learning culture in my MESA program. Parts two and three essentially define the learning culture. Part one answers a question, why learning culture? Part four addresses leadership, internships, and research, because beyond developing scholars, the learning culture develops leaders. And part five reviews educational planning basics. In addition, basic learning culture training videos for each part are available on the Turning on the Lights website. And the book, Turning on the Lights, Using Learning Culture to Increase Student Success, is available as a reference with complete details, how-to instruction, and up to 40 student stories to bring the learning culture to life. This is the same training that I provide to my Mesa creators to give them a new consciousness and transform their lives. What impact can the learning culture have on your students? This one page, Contents at a Glance, identifies the contents in Turning on the Lights. This learning culture model is not only comprehensive, it is exceptional in the quality of the contents and its simplicity makes it very, very powerful. In particular, these two parts define the learning culture. Note the powerful language of success in part two, beginning with potential. Potential is not questioned in the learning culture, but commitment is questioned. Creators accept responsibility, take action, and seek solutions, while self-saboteurs choose to blame, complain, and make excuses. And students must know the secret to success, which means that they must want it as much as they want to breathe. And this must be demonstrated through actions, not words. Other important factors include self-advocacy, emotional intelligence, mental toughness, and goal focus. In particular, self-advocacy means that students must fight for themselves. And this is the opposite of being shy. Also, emotional intelligence is not only about, is not only important for academics, it is important for leadership. And students must know the purpose for the learning, which is freedom, because this gives them the ability to define themselves rather than be defined by others, outcomes, or situations. In this way, students know the meaning of the phrase, you define you. Finally, embracing vulnerability is not a question. It is what students must do to succeed and become courageous leaders. And part two, part three identifies the strategies for effectively approaching the learning. As shown by the completion statistics, I was one of the lucky ones. I survived by instinct. I could not articulate then how I was able to succeed, but I know it now. We are products of our environment. If this language and strategies are not present in our students' environment, how are they expected to succeed? Here are two gifts for you and all students. These are learning culture stand-up displays. These pocket-sized displays illustrate what is meant by learning culture. And the simple format provides an easily accessible desktop visual reminder of the key language and symbols in the learning culture. The templates are available online for anyone to print, cut, and display where they can be used as daily reminders and sources of inspiration. I propose that this unique learning culture strategy simultaneously benefits students as well as faculty. The learning culture training is now available for students and faculty are invited to apply the learning culture praxis. What are the, what are the cost implications? At a minimum, it costs nothing. The learning culture training is available free online and application of the learning culture praxis simply takes being mindful and intentional. This illustration this illustration identifies how this strategy moves from theory to practice. It highlights the elements in the proposed core praxis model for a learning culture, and it was derived from the praxis in our Mesa learning culture model. Note the relevant theories and research on the right, which support the model. Also note the core elements, beginning with commitment and ending with early alert as a strategy for overcoming challenges. A key lesson learned is that the learning culture must be explicit and include the use of positive, proactive language. And it must be validating the students. It must contribute to an increased sense of belonging, and it must facilitate effective student engagement and high expectations. A lessons learned handout using an inquiry approach is available to guide the reader through the learning culture praxis. Also, a stand-up display of the core praxis model for a learning culture is av available as a visual reminder for educators of the core learning culture elements and associated theory and research. Visit the turningonthelights.com website for a welcome to the learning culture video, a learning culture training plan for students, a learning culture immersion plan for faculty and staff, and other learning culture resources and handouts. This is what a revolution looks like. Beginning fall 2022, 
Entering students in the University of California, Berkeley College of Engineering will be introduced to the learning culture through turning on the lights. This has also created an opportunity for the UC Berkeley College of Engineering to become a leader in a Bay Area learning culture network, including 21 regional community colleges for increasing student success and transfer. These are speaker quotes from the Q&A kickoff for the Bay Area network. The lead, rev the lead Berkeley revolutionary shared, the learning culture is so impactful and powerful. Turning on the lights puts everything together in one nice package. I really appreciate the approach. It is not a deficit model. In fact, just the opposite. We are celebrating what students bring to the table and closing any gaps. My Mesa star and Berkeley grad shared this learning culture revolution is empowering and enabling students to be successful. And I think as leaders on your campus, that should be your main focus. Turning on the lights works. And finally, the higher education legend, Dr. Laura Rendon, contributed final thoughts by sharing Congratulations to all of you for the work that you're doing. You have a model here that is needed for educators that are working particularly with low income first generation students who have the drive, who have the hopes and dreams, who have the ganas, that is desire to succeed, to go on and be scientists, architects, professors, whatever they wanna do, but they often don't know how to realize those dreams. You're offering an empowering based approach that really takes what's inside of the students. That power is there. That resilience is there. It just needs to be brought out. And this is what you're doing, which is one of the most important things that can happen when students participate in the learning culture. Based, based on my work with City College STEM faculty, here is my recommended sample plan for empowering students with the learning culture. First, introduce a learning culture to students and engage them in the application of learning culture practices and strategies followed by modeling the learning culture for the students and reinforcing and validating the students' mastery of the learning culture. Then follow up with students to learn about any impacts and identify any gaps. Additionally, it is critical to capture data metrics to gauge the effectiveness of the praxis. This is what the power of the learning culture looks like. This Mesa star did not believe in herself when she began her college studies. However, empowered with the learning culture, she was a regular, regular on, the, on, the, on the academic role. She conducted summer research and she is transferring this fall to a university in chemistry with the goal of earning a doctoral degree in a science discipline. She also identifies the importance of mental toughness and self-advocacy in her journey. And she identifies with the statement, you define you, adding, this is immensely powerful because the biggest enemy we often face is ourselves. It's a phrase I go back home to when I feel lost or overwhelmed. It has given me direction and a sense of purpose and motivation to work towards my goals. Dr. Beto's story is equally powerful. He has earned bachelor's and master's degree in, degrees in biology and a doctorate in educational leadership. And he, was, and he was previously incarcerated before joining our MESA program, but that did not define him. Empowered with the learning culture, he defined himself. Dr. Bethel's story is included in turning on the lights. Finally, the recent Blue Origin space launch involved one mission and two Mesa success stories launched at San Diego City College. Katya became the first Mexican-born space crew member and the youngest female astronaut, and her Mesa brother Joel is a Blue Origin crew capsule engineer. It is also important to note that while my Mesa stars come from different generations of Mesa creators, they all share the same powerful learning culture and language of success. And why is this important? Because as community colleges, we take the top 100% of students. At Cities College, an Hispanic serving institution, my Mesa creators are primarily first generation in college, underrepresented in STEM, and economically disadvantaged. When they come to me, some have low GPAs, have dropped out of the university or community college or both, and yet some are previously incarcerated. But these are only outcomes and situations. They do not define my Mesa creators. It is not a coincidence. Mesa creators may fit the profile of students who are least likely to succeed, but they have great potential and the learning culture empowers them to take control of their learning and their futures. 100% of them are trained in the learning culture. And when they transfer to four-year universities, 100% of them are expected to earn their bachelor's degrees in STEM majors. My Mesa creators are exceptional STEM professionals and leaders with many going on to graduate school and some earning doctoral degrees from Harvard, MIT, Vanderbilt, Uppsala University in Sweden and other top graduate schools. 
This, is, this also is what higher education revolutionaries look like. After attending my le learning culture presentation, Professor Will Cole spent the next two days immersing herself completely in the learning culture by experiencing every resource on the turningonthelights.com website for the purpose of empowering her students. Similarly, Turning on the Lights has given Dr. McKee new purpose. She knows that this learning culture strategy is missing in academia, and she is making it her mission to turn on the lights for faculty and students at her college. There is no longer a reason why any student should, re should be in the dark with regards to the learning culture. Before concluding, I want to share this final thought amongst friends and revolutionaries. Certainly, the completion rates in higher education call for a revolution, and that is precisely the purpose of turning on the lights. And the typical student response after finding the learning culture is, I wish I knew it when I started. I invite you as fellow revolutionaries to be gate smashers and be inspired to use turning on the lights to help transform student lives wherever you know it is needed. If you have any questions, if you have any questions or need, a, need assistance related to the learning culture praxis model, here is my contact information. I'm doing my part to transform student lives and I'm doing my best to make the learning culture training and resources easily available off the shelf as much as possible. The learning culture is educational wealth, and it is a form of privilege that is now available to all students. And with this presentation, it now belongs to the world. It is there now. It is a revolution. And I am not asking for permission or apologizing to transform student lives. I ask you, is the strategy of using learning culture to increase student success simply another best practice? Or is it an essential practice for creating a crucial foundation for students to succeed? Thank you for sharing this time and space with me. I hope that whatever I may have shared may be helpful to you and your efforts because the battle continues. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Dr. Rafael, uh, for a wonderful presentation and insightful presentation on the learning culture. Uh, the, yeah, I'm also doing this um, on behalf of Bozo loudly. Um, are there any questions or comments for Rafael? You, uh, uh, let me check the chat. You are also most welcome to raise your hand and comment. And I make, um, yes, it, you, well, yes. while we while we wait for any questions or comments, I want to personally thank uh, Professor Amory, who I see has joined the session, and uh, I want to thank Professor Amory for um, you know facilitating and allowing me this opportunity to share um, the uh, uh, learning culture. With, with this community of Praxis here, international community, it's really an honor and a privilege to be able to do so. Professor Amory, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Bowie, thank you for facilitating the session. We have a few minutes. I am I am the corner man. And why am I the corner man? Because, my stu because um, my, every student must know, my students know, this is a fight. I'm not a coach. No one, no one is playing a game here. This is a fight. My stu students must know this is a fight. They must want to fight, but more than that, they must know how to fight. The role of a corner man is to train his fighters to know how to fight. My students know how to fight. Look at the successes. Oh, they know how to fight. But then during a fight, the role of a corner man is to take care of his fighters during a fight. And that is exactly what I do for my students. So there, that is where the nickname, the corner man comes, comes from. And they address me as corner man. They address me, corner man. When they address me as corner man, that's very important to me because they're embracing my role in their lives. And, and that is very important. And we know our students, you know, some of them may be marginalized and, and, and they've been receiving the messages that they don't have what it takes. It's not that they don't have what it takes. Of course they have what it takes. They just have gaps and they're in the dark with this thing called learning culture. That's why I'm turning on the lights for my students. And now I'm turning on the lights internationally and I'm honored to do that. Thank you. So thank you, thank very, you very much for coming to see um, you, 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 you created a small uh, uh, problem for me because you're on the other side of the world. So we changed the format to have a 
uh, current sessions after some of the plenary. So thank you for doing that because I think it has worked quite well. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. It's Alan. Ah, thank you, Alan. I don't know, are there any other questions? If there's no questions, I always like to flip it. When I have a, a session and a presenter, I flip it with my students. I ask them, I ask my students, if you don't have a question, give, share, give back to the presenter by giving a reaction. Or is there a reaction from anyone, a, a comment, a reaction? Maybe, maybe I was muted and no one heard my presentation. I don't know. But what did you hear? Did anyone, you know, I can tell you this. I was first generation in college. I knew no one that went to college from my neighborhood. There is a learning, a culture for learning in every institution of higher education. And that culture is deep culture. No one told me about the culture for learning. No one told me. And, and, and so, it, and it's a fight. We're in the dark. Why? Let's turn on the lights. Anyone, any reactions from anyone? I welcome um, you. They, there are a couple of reactions in the chat and one question or one reaction, but some did some reaction on the Zoom platform in terms of reaction of raising hands and sharp, sharp. Um, but there are two comments and one question. And the question says, how many students have or are participating in your program? That's a great question. Uh, Pre-COVID, we worked with about an average of 200 students a year, okay? And now, of course, COVID has provided some challenges. We're working to get back up to that level, but we, we are, we're maybe at 150, but we want to work up to 200. But can you imagine I've been doing this since 2000? So I've, I've worked with literally thousands of students, but truthfully, since 2009, when I found that research, where researchers interviewed successful first-generation college students to understand what does it take for college readiness and success, that was my light bulb moment. Since 2009, all of my students, hundreds of them, thousands, have been introduced to the learning culture. I would, I would do that. Um, let me see. I, I see a question from the admin. Would you, could you read that, please, Dr. Bui? Uh I'm going to do the same as Alan, I'm Elizabeth, sorry. <laughs> Would you say that students of color have to fight harder to, uh, to be recognized than those who are white? You know, that, that, is, that is a great question. I, I think um, I will say it like this, fight harder in the sense that, um, you know, it's so important for our students to, to, to see role models, to see others who look like them. We know the importance of that. So in that sense, there is a sense of fighting harder because when you don't see role models, how are you, what, what are you, what goals are you setting? And so in that sense, um, but I will tell you, it is so beautiful to see students just block. You saw the video, Mr. Ferrari. He said to us, he tells everyone he was depressed. He's been trucking. He's been working so hard. He gets a B. He's never gotten an A. He was depressed and in, in having self-doubt. Why am I doing this? Why? And then when he lear learned this, when he was introduced to this learning culture, he got it his first A. How beautiful to see his, his, he, him grow and, and, and feel like he discovered fire. He, dis he did discover fire. That's, that's, that's what's beautiful to see. So I have only about a minute or so. I invite everyone, you know, don't, don't take my, my uh, word for it. Visit turningonthelights.com. How can those resources benefit you and your students? It's there now. I invite you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you very much, Rafael, for a wonderful and insightful presentation. And I think it's shared by all participants in this session. Um, on my clock, I'm one minute. Um, <clears throat> I know our next presenter is also in the room. And unfortunately, we are almost, uh, yeah, I am on the dot. Uh, Poto, um, probably uh, Rafael will answer your question in the chat as well. So our next presenter is Dr. Gavin McGaver. And his topic will be on mentoring support program for rural origin health science students. 
Um, Gavin, you have 20 minutes or so for your presentation and allow 10 minutes for question and answer so that people can give you feedback or comment on your wonderful presentation that you're going to give us. Over to you. Thank you, Elizabeth and everybody that has stayed to the last session. So from Santiago to rural KwaZulu-Natal, um, I'm Gavin McGregor, the director of the Mtombo Youth Development Foundation. And uh, we exist to try and address staff shortages at rural hospitals, specifically in KwaZulu-Natal and two hospitals in the Eastern Cape. Um, and we do this by investing in rural youth um, who have the interest in studying a health science degree um, and the ability. And uh, the question always is, so why do we invest in rural youth? Because uh, you must realize that comes with challenges. Uh, the research shows us that if a um, healthcare professional comes from a rural area, they are more likely to live and work in a rural area once they qualified. And so that is the main reason. Um, they also understand the language and culture of their patients. Um, and they, we know what youth unemployment is like in South Africa and the uh, rural youth are worst affected by that. So we're wanting to offer them opportunities as well. As you can imagine, rural youth are poorly equipped for higher education. Uh, their language, English uh, language uh, is poor. Their ability with technology is poor, mainly because they've come from um, schools that are not teaching in English. Uh, there's no technology. All of our students come from non-fee paying rural schools. Um, and uh, our students are currently studying at 16 different campuses across the country, which provides a challenge in terms of us providing support to them. And uh, so that's what, what I want to uh, share with you today, how we get around that. So just uh, to give you some idea where we are, there's Durban down the bottom. And uh, you, these uh, red crosses are the hospitals that we partner with. Um, up on the top above uh, is uh, Mozambique, and this white section here is Swaziland. So very, very rural. Um, and our model, um, as I say, we, we've been, so we've been going since 1999. We've been doing this for 21, 22 years. Um, essentially, we're trying to help these hospitals with staffing because uh, healthcare professionals don't really want to work in uh, rural areas because of lack of opportunity for spouses, uh, schooling for children, and so on and so on. A lot of reasons. And that's why, again, we invest in rural um, students because they do have networks once they've graduated. So we uh, tell school learners about um, health sciences and career options. Uh, they can then go and visit the local hospital to learn more about the health uh, science that they're interested in. And then ultimately we conduct our selection interviews at the local hospital. The students who are successful then uh, go to university and this is where we kick in and this is what I'll be talking about today is our uh, academic and social mentoring support as well as financial support. So the eligibility um, criteria for students to qualify for our support, they must come from those areas that I showed you on the map. They must have applied and obtained a place to study a health science degree. And they have to do that themselves so we, we can see some initiative. Um, more recently, they must have applied and obtained NSFAS funding. Previously, we were a full cost funder, but because NSFAS now is providing full cost bursaries, and our students are all eligible because they come from non-fee paying schools and the um, household income is very really low. They must have gone and done one week voluntary work at the local hospital. So if they're interested in doing occupational therapy, for, an exa uh, for example, they must have gone to the hospital and volunteered there for a week um, to learn more about what occupational therapy is all about. And then they must commit to work in a rural underserved area when they qualify. Um, 
we're currently supporting 180 uh, to 250 students a year. Um, we're also down um, on numbers at the moment, uh, mainly because of uh, funding constraints over the last three years with the South African economy and then COVID. Um, so we are hoping to get back up to uh, about 220 students. Uh, we're currently this year supporting 171. So in terms of our mentoring support, the aim is to provide academic, social and emotional support to all our students, as well as top up financial support. And just to mention for all our students, this program is compulsory. They have no choice. Um, also to highlight, uh, we are not tutoring uh, because the universities offer uh, tutors um, and you'll see more uh, specifically just now what, what our intervention is. So we have a network of local mentors so, um, situated on campus, 16 different campuses and uh, 11, currently we've got 11 mentors, eight are university staff, one is a postgraduate student, uh, one is one of our own graduates and uh, one is a young lady we met along the way. So just to give you an idea of how this works, in, at the organization, we have a staff person responsible for students and they then interact with all the mentors, our 11 or 12 mentors, depending each year we have different numbers. And then a local mentor situated at the university or close to the university would, would uh, relate to five to 12 students generally. We have one mentor who has 30 students, but she does this uh, kind of full time. Um, and uh, those students then have to meet with a mentor every month. Our mentoring support starts when the students get on campus. And because our students are health science students, they generally start uh, university end of January. And so their first meeting with their mentor would be in February, and that will go right on till November, December. Um, as I mentioned, the program is, is compulsory and the way we, we provide top up um, financial support to the students for food and books. And so if they haven't met with a mentor, uh, we just withhold their monthly uh, food allowance, the, the top up food allowance. And uh, but surprisingly, very quickly, they will contact us and say, I didn't get my money. And then we will say to them, well, you didn't meet your mentor. And as soon as you meet your mentor, we'll release your payment. So that ha generally happens once to a student, then they learn the lesson that there's a consequence uh, if they don't do what they should be doing. So the aim of, of the mentoring program is to uh, help the student understand um, where they're going wrong. So, you know, um, we want to understand how they're doing academically, socially, and emotionally. Um, and when a student meets with a mentor, they have to come with the latest results, tests, assessments, um, practical work, whatever that is, they must bring their results. And then the, the mentor's role is to assist the student to develop a plan of action and then hold them accountable to implement the plan. So the typical example would be new students uh, start in February, they write tests in March and they fail. And they meet with a mentor and the mentor's general question would be, how are you doing? And students says, fine, well, let's see your marks. And uh, the mark might be 38%. And then the question is, so what are you gonna do about it? Um, so the mentor would be saying to the student, what are you going to do about it? And the typical type of response is, oh, I'll work harder. Um, I'll ask my friend or, and so the mentor would then guide the student and say, look, we would want you to go and see your lecturer um, and get a tutor allocated to you. Um, so the, the point I'm making is the mentor is directing the student to get real help, help that will help them, rather than asking a student who also failed. Um, and you must know that these students are very shy. Um, the English is not good. So they don't feel confident to go and ask a lecturer, but we make that a condition 
of that support. Uh, important point, as I've mentioned already, is that our mentors are not tutors, so they will, they, they will not help students with anatomy and physiology and, and all these tough um, uh, preclinical uh, health science courses. And that's why they are referred to the relevant department. And we know that at every department, uh, there are tutors, the postgrad students uh, who can provide support to um, students. But the point is the students have to go and ask for help. And so that's what we are trying to, um, that's what we're holding the students accountable for doing, is going and asking for help and asking for it early. Don't wake up in October and say, I've got exams. And so this, that's why this process happens already in March. Um, and in most cases, we find that students who are failing in March, by June, they are passing. So the mentor, uh, to try and standardize our approach across 16 campuses, we've got a standardized template. Um, and I'll show you an example a little bit later, which covers academic and social issues. Um, and the uh, mentor, as they speak to the student or after a meeting with the student, they complete that template, which then becomes a, a report, which the mentor then sends to the student manager. And so our student manager who sits here in the office is able to go through each report and, and see how every student is doing across the country. We pay our mentors, so when they submit their report, they will then be paid for um, each report that they've submitted. In addition to our um, academic and social mentoring support, our students are required to do four weeks work experience. And because we have a relationship with those hospitals, those 15 hospitals, our students actually go back to the hospital where they were selected and they would complete four weeks work experience in a year. It might be two weeks in June, July, it may be uh, two weeks in December. This allows students to complement their theory with practice, and they also become orientated to rural practice, which ultimately we want them to do when they qualify is to go back and work in a rural area. In addition, we also hold life uh, skills workshops where we look at things like financial literacy. How do you manage yourself well um, in terms of um, you know, um, safe sex, um, HIV, AIDS? And then we also are um, very interested in, in developing the soft skills like uh, communication skills, uh, emotional intelligence, um, uh, compassion, and so on. And then, as I mentioned, we also top up, uh, provide top up um, uh, amounts to the NSFAS. Uh, so we supplement the NSFAS food allowance. And being health science students, they generally require more books. They also require uh, certain equipment, like optometry students need a, a trial set. And that uh, they currently cost about 20,000 Rand. Uh, which our students can't afford, and that's where we would step in and, and pay that. So here's an example of a, um, a mentor having submitted her report for Skumbuzo, who's a fifth year medical student at the University of Pretoria. And you will see that we talk about the academic progress, and uh, here she says that Skumbuzo is doing well. Uh, he's Busy with six blocks, he's, managed, he's passed five, and here we have the actual marks listed. So at a glance, if you receive this report, you can see the student is coping. Um, we don't really have a concern here. And then we talk about the social issues. Um, and here she's saying he's found his rhythm, balancing his house committee duties with his studies. Um, so we, we generally, we're interested in the whole student, not just uh, the fact that they can pass, uh, but also how they're coping socially. And we are all very aware that mental health has become a big issue, um, and especially since COVID and the disruption to the academic learning, face-to-face uh, -face learning. Um, and so we also work with a partner called Sight, 
uh, which provides um, mental health support to our students. So yeah, that's a, a summary of that report. So in terms of results and achievements, how have we done since 1999? These are our first students. We, we started with four students in 1999 with a, uh, the founder had this great idea, crazy idea of investing in rural youth to study health science degrees as a way of addressing staff shortages at rural hospitals. So uh, four students, uh, slowly it's grown and we up to, as, as you can see, when things were really peaking, when I'm saying peaking, that was funding that we could raise. We had about, uh, we had 252 students. Um, but we're interested really here today in the, in the red line. Um, so we started with past, so these are progression rates, annual progression rates. How many students will pro progress each year? Um, and so it started from around 75 uh, more consistently. So we, we, we started our, our um, local mentoring program in 2010. And here you can see a more consistent um, progression rate of between 90 and 93%. Bearing in mind, these are all rural origin students, all matriculating from non-fee paying schools, studying health science qualifications. And the majority of our students are studying uh, medicine. So here are our medical students. I've taken data from the Department of Higher Education um, over uh, the period 2000 to 210, uh, 2010 and these are our averages. So the national statistics will say that 70% of medical students would complete in year six. In our case, bearing in mind all our students are come from non-free paying schools, 82% of them will complete in six years. The national statistics in uh, N plus one, so year seven, around 82% of them will be complete. And in our case, 98% would have completed their medical qualification. And by year three, 99% are done. So we've accounted for all of them. Literally, uh, you do have those that 1% that may go on. We also need to realize that the national statistics include the brightest, brightest brains in the world in, in South Africa, those students who attended private schools, had an extra tuition, um, excelled in everything, um, and they're still forming part of this national average. Whereas our students, yes, small numbers, but they are achieving better than the national average. So this just gives you a glimpse of our, our current number of graduates. A, a, a big achievement is 55% of these graduates are young women. And in light of them being of rural origin, that is very significant. Um, so, and they, yeah, they are now financially empowered, they're educationally empowered, and uh, they are really um, empowered in many ways. Looking at dropouts, so from 1999 to 2021, 2021, 85 students have been excluded, mainly for poor academic performance. That they are excluded by us because they're not meeting our requirements. We've also excluded students for pure, poor attitude um, with the understanding that if they can't comply with our, the few regulations we have, um, what kind of healthcare professionals would they be? So we've excluded them, them there. So some of those students did go on uh, with their own, um, financial support or by hook and by crook, and some of them have graduated. So this is not a true dropout. It's, it's, it's the students we've excluded. But using that figure, it translates to an overall throughput over all those years of 86%, which is still, again, above the national averages. So conclusions. Um, this, the establishment of a network of mentors has enabled students on 16 different campuses to have a face-to-face -face meeting. And we feel strongly that a face-to-face -face meeting is a good thing. I did listen to a presentation earlier today 
uh, about DUT students and their response, and they also felt that face-to-face -face, uh, is more helpful, um, just so that you can read a student's body language, students are more open, uh, a relationship, a better relationship is developed between the student and the mentor. Um, our mentors are not healthcare professionals, um, and, and they don't tutor, so what that means is we can tap into a lot of people um, and, and just train them to, to uh, be mentors. With the program being compulsory, students are forced to face their challenges early in the academic year. And I think that's a key thing. Often, uh, students leave uh, addressing the problems too late. Um, and when they try and get help, uh, it's too far down the academic year for them to uh, make any successful uh, comeback. The program has ensured that above average numbers of students graduate. So by having this mentoring support and the financial support, because we know that every student need fo needs food, books, and decent accommodation on the day they arrive at university. So we know that the challenges with the NSFAS, uh, so it doesn't help that a student does get the allowances, but they only kick in in April when they've been on campus since January. So that's where we would fit in and ensure that the students have food and books and that the accommodation is decent and conducive to study. Um, this is what I've just mentioned, barriers to success such as a lack of food and books and unsuitable accommodation have been removed. Um, and through a moderate level of support, we've shown that the rural youth have huge potential. Um, our support is not uh, intensive, it's not expensive, and just with that little bit of, of support and holding students accountable, these youth are succeeding. Uh, whereas a lot of people would have written them off uh, before they even started. And for me, the key to success is holding students accountable to address the issues early in the academic year. That's our message to anybody uh, who's interested in supporting students to succeed. Ensure that intervention happens at the beginning of the year. Um, in terms of student compliance, we have a very high level of compliance. Students appreciate the support they receive. Um, it might be uncomfortable at times when they're not doing well, but they appreciate the fact that they have someone to talk to, they have, uh, uh, they're getting advice that is helpful, um, and ultimately they're passing, um, which is what they want and what we want and what the university needs. And so just to conclude, um, these are a snippet of some of our, our graduates, a psychologist, first psychologist pr produced, he graduated in 2010. Um, Franz Kumala was one of the four students in 1999. Um, and a social worker, social worker, I, I can tell you stories about how these guys have had an impact. This lady is a specialist, uh, pediatrician. She's a family medicine specialist. Um, this guy has been working in a rural area for 13 years uh, as a nurse, um, made a huge change. And uh, um, he, uh, I'm trying, just trying to, I've just forgotten his name, but he's a speech therapist um, and he is partially sighted, comes from a rural community and qualified as a, as a speech therapist, went back to his community as an inspiration to what can be achieved uh, even with a disability. So thank you for your time and your attention and I'm willing to answer any questions or take any comments. Thank you. Thank you, Gavin, for a very inspiring presentation and insightful presentation when it comes to the support of rural students as well that you um that you are doing um there are some complimentary comments in the chat are there any questions for gavin um or if you want to give gavin a comment you need to unmute uh do you want to ask your question
You can unmute and ask, otherwise I will ask it on your behalf. I'm sure I can ask. So I'm just interested, interested rather in ethical considerations when withholding meal allowances. Oh, good question. Um, look, the students are going to get their meal allowance from Innisfas. And uh, so they, it's not as though we're not, we, we withholding a top up, but it's literally, it happens once to a student in, a, in, their, in their four year qualification or in their sixth year qualification. It, it's just a, a, a consequence. Um, they, they, they've signed up with us. Um, it's, it's a willing relationship um, in terms of, of um, and, and we have specific, uh, they've signed a, a code of conduct that they are required to meet with a mentor every month. And if they don't meet their mentor, this would be one of the consequences. So they've agreed to that. Um, but yeah, it's a small amount. And I, and I can tell you that uh, they will get the allowance as soon as they meet with a mentor. So it's not, I uh, did highlight it, but it's, it, it's, it's uh, that it's a consequence, but it very rarely happens uh, in reality. I hope that uh, addresses your concern. Okay, it seems as it addresses her concern. Are there any other questions or comments for Gavin? I know that it's been a long day, but are there questions? If there are no questions, or comments, then we can conclude today's session. But before you leave, just hold on. Don't leave me. Don't go anywhere. Stay with me. Stay here with me. Thank you, Gavin, for a wonderful presentation that you gave us. And I also want to appreciate all the speakers or all the presenters today. Um, it is the end, we come to end, the end of day two of Siapumelela. Uh, we are going to start tomorrow at nine o'clock uh, with a plenary session. We hope to see you all tomorrow. Thank you for being here up until six o'clock. Enjoy the rest of your evening. We will see you tomorrow. Tony, is there anything else? No, I don't think so. You've done what I might have done, which is say what's happening <laughs> in the morning. So that's great. Thank you. No problem. Therefore, everyone, thank you for participating and bye-bye.